Thank you for downloading our podcast. This Christmas season, we consider Luke's testimony of Christ. Luke sets out to write an orderly account so that his friend Theophilus can be certain regarding the things he has been taught. What is Luke fundamentally teaching us about the significance of Christ and Christ's entrance into history? Well, we're going to finish up our series of Luke this week. And Lord willing, next week we'll go back into Hosea and finish up Hosea. And then when we finish Hosea, go back into Luke, uh, picking up where we leave off this week. And so when we look at this Christ uh, narrative and what Christ is doing here, obviously he's rather passive because his parents are taking him to the temple. But nevertheless, we do find how Christ is the one who is coming, entering history. Uh, He is a child who is fulfilling uh, the Lord's requirements, and he is submitting uh, to the Lord's law perfectly. Even his parents submit perfectly. And as we hear this, one of the things that really shocks me about this narrative And it's something that I think is very relevant for us today, even though we can, not that I say that we're going to have revelation or that I'm bringing revelation from the Spirit. But the thing that's shocking in this narrative is how the Lord is one who works through the ordinary means and does extraordinary things. Because Christ is merely going to the temple, and I You know, you you read this narrative and you think, how is it that a parent just give this child to this man and this man just takes his child? They have no idea who this is. But then you realize this is their firstborn son. They're they're kind of going through the, the process of learning as to what this looks like. And as they look at this and we hear this, these two prophetic utterances. One, we actually hear the prophecy. The other one, we just hear a report that there is a prophecy. But as we hear this, we say, well, what do these unexpected witnesses really tell us about Christ? What are these unexpected witnesses truly telling us about the assurance of Christ being the great Redeemer who comes to confirm God's promise and to bring about the redemption of Jerusalem? And so as we consider this, we'll see first you have um, Joseph and Mary following the Lord's prophet Moses, fulfilling his requirements. And then we hear God's prophets who are contemporaries of Christ in the temple uh, declaring what Christ is to do. And so let's begin with following God's prophet. As I mentioned in the introduction, I I marvel, and I think it's important as we set the stage of this narrative to understand how ordinary this is. Uh, So this is basically a mother and a father going about the expected transaction of paying the redemption for the firstborn son, as we read in Exodus 13, tied to um, the great redemptive event of the Exodus where Israel is delivered from the land of Egypt. As they're delivered from the land of Egypt, the Lord is showing the significance of the firstborn son. Christ is not one who's above the law, even as he is God and man joined together. Christ is the one who is fulfilling what God has set out so that we are those who can be brought together, we can have life, and we can have our redemption in him. And so as we we find this, seeing Mary and Joseph doing simply what Moses requires of them, going to the temple, paying the redemption, and expecting this to be any other day. But yet through that ordinary event, something extraordinary happens. Uh, This is something where when when you think about this, this narrative, you know, so often just reflecting on this, thinking about even our prayers, I mean, how tragic it is that when we pray for something then we're surprised that it actually comes to pass right (laughs) I mean God tells us that he hears our prayers and so this is something we say is ordinary something we ordinarily do and God by his providence accomplishes extraordinary things and so that's that's driven home here 
Something that's mundane, something that's everyday, nothing exceptional going on in this narrative in and of itself. Just another peasant family coming into the temple to pay redemption on Israel's New Year. Or or that celebrates Israel's New Year and commemorates the turning of their calendar of being the ultimate redemptive people. Now as we go on and we think about the reaction of Joseph and Mary, that, that they marvel at what Simeon says, right? Verse 33. They marvel at this. And this is something else that that kind of jumped out at me because you you think about what they've already been through. Mary has had a a child in an unprecedented way. This has never happened before in history. We even said that's probably some of the underlying tension as to why Joseph and Mary are those that don't get special treatment. Uh, The people probably are a little skeptical of his testimony Uh, that this is just a a virgin birth. But nevertheless, certainly by the shepherd's prophecy, uh, they realize something extraordinary is happening here. We also think of Mary and Joseph having uh, revelations of angels. Now, in Luke's gospel, Mary receives a revelation. Matthew's gospel, Joseph receives a revelation. So we put these uh, reports together by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit uh, as their inspired writers Both Mary and Joseph have already had revelation given to them directly by an angel. We think of Elizabeth conceiving and having a child after so many years of barrenness. Zechariah having the vision in the temple. So there's all these extraordinary things that have happened. And you would think that just seeing an old man in the temple saying a prophecy wouldn't be that shocking at this point. But we find even within ourselves who we are. The tragedy of the human condition in who we are. We don't expect God to fulfill his promises. That's one of the things we do take from this as Luke calls attention again and again uh, to people's reactions. We don't expect God to fulfill his promises. But on the flip side of this, we find that God fulfills his promises despite his people. And praise be to him that God is faithful despite what we expect from him. And so what's all going on in in terms of this narrative as they go to pay this redemption? Well, as they go and they pay this redemption and they encounter and fulfill what Moses requires of them. That the purification has happened. So Mary basically has had Jesus 30 days ago. So the time of purification as Moses requires is done. Now she's going to the temple to pay this redemption. Now when we read Exodus 13, I wanted to call this to our attention. You do have sort of a hierarchy of animals, don't you? I mean, obviously, a donkey is going to be more valuable than a lamb. In a sense, that a donkey you're going to be able to take to market. You're going to use it to plow. You're going to use that animal for a variety of things. It's a multi-purpose animal, if you will. A, a lamb, it, it, it will generate some income for you. There's certainly some benefit to the animal, but it's not as valuable or uh, wise uh, to keep a lamb versus a donkey. So, There's a provision there that when a donkey is born, you can either break its neck if you don't want to give up the lamb, or you can offer a lamb in the place of it. So that's one thing where you see the Lord offering these options. But there's another option that that we might miss. That there's an option for a peasant family. Uh, A peasant family is not one who's able to bring uh, the full lamb or to bring the full redemption or or the full burnt offering for the sacrifice of a child. And so the option then is the two turtle doves. So this tells us that Mary and Joseph are in a position of the peasant class, that they're bringing the the cheapest of cheap things that the Lord gives as a provision. So we we have this class status set right here. That's important. They're they're, uh, insignificant peasant people easily overlooked as we said by the way Luke presents Mary possible she's even an orphan 
so not significant in terms of society's view of them. This is subtly communicated to us again as they bring the turtle doves. They are not significant in terms of society. And so as they engage in this transaction, we find this man who is uh, characterized to us as a rather significant individual. Not necessarily that he's wealthy, not necessarily that he's of the elite, but significant in the sense that he's described as righteous and devout. So this is telling us that it's a man who has lived his life consciously desiring to follow God. And this is a man who lives his life righteously, which means that he has followed the law of Moses to the T. Uh, he has not compromised the law of Moses, has not taken this in a legalistic way, but he's righteous in the sense that, that he has not compromised his identity as a Jewish individual. Now this is important, because when Christ interacts with the Pharisees, they identify themselves as righteous and devout. But what do they look for? They look for a Messiah of their own creation, right? Instead of God taking us and working in his providence to shape and mold us because we are the creature, he's a creator, he's a sanctifier, the Pharisees flip it. They stand over the word of God. They stand over the Lord. They shape the Lord in their image of what they expect the Lord to be. So this is important because we have a man who is characterized as not compromising the law of God, following the original prophet Moses to the T, and he is committed to the purpose of God. Now notice what his drive for life is as he submits to the true prophet Moses. You know, right? The paradigm prophet. I will raise up prophets like unto you, as the Lord says when Moses is giving his farewell in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18, the, the assurance that I will raise up prophets like unto you. If his word doesn't come to pass, don't fear that man. He's not a true prophet. Right? So we, we recall these things. But this man who orients himself in light of the true prophet Moses orients himself waiting for the consolation, the encouragement of Israel. Think about the declaration of this. This is a man who has not compromised his holiness. This is a man who is truly devout to the purpose of God. But he's not finding his confidence in himself. He's not saying, I'm devout, I'm righteous, I'm the one who's going to establish the kingdom, and I'm the one who knows how to do these things. He's looking for the consolation, the encouragement of Israel. We think of the language of what Isaiah has said, things like in Isaiah 66, of receiving true life and the hope of the abundance of what will happen in the holy city as Anna also looks to uh, the redemption that comes to Jerusalem, right? So the prophets have said these things of old. We think of Isaiah 57, 18, where the Lord looks upon his people, sees the wickedness of man. So it's recalling that even in Israel, a situation like Genesis 6, echoing the reality of what happens before the flood, but what is the Lord going to do? He will bring consolation, encouragement, and healing in his Redeemer. So this means that this pious prophet who orients his life in the prophet Moses, Simeon does not see himself as above the norms of God. He puts himself in a class of people like Isaiah 57, echoing Genesis 6, needing the consolation of Israel. Now what I want to drive home here is that if there is anyone who is probably not like the people of Genesis 6 and probably not like the people of Israel, it's Simeon. And yet this man in this high status, as Luke establishes him, needs the Christ child. And does not look within himself for his hope, but he looks to Christ. 
This is the ultimate consolation, recreator of the people of God. It's not Moses. It's not following the law of Moses to the T. It is finding consolation in a promised one that Isaiah says the Lord is sending. This is a child who is coming. This is the one who is ultimately cut off so the firstborn is no longer cut off anymore. And so when we hear this, we say, okay, so we understand Mary, Joseph, peasants, low in status, low in prestige, follow the law of Moses. Come to the temple, pay the peasants' redemption, and here is an exalted man in terms of his piety, in terms of his identity, here at the temple, who also looks for the consolation. Now we hear what this prophet has to say. Now, imagine this picture. And this is something that also kind of makes me chuckle when you think of what's going on here. There's, there's no doubt. This is that, that sort of, I guess, maybe in our culture, the way we'd say is maybe like that one encouraging greeter, maybe at Costco or maybe at Walmart, that you go and, and just brightens your day, right? You, you walk in and there's just something about that elderly person that just exudes like I love life you know I I just love life and so you have a bad day you talk to this person and and your whole attitude changes that's kind of how I picture Simeon the one who expects the Messiah to come that you come into the temple he says hey the Messiah is arriving the Lord's told me our redemption is around the corner The great king has not forsaken his people, right? So you walk into the temple, you receive this greeting. You you may come in and say, where is God? Does God love us? Does God care about us? You see this man, you say, yes, the Lord loves us. The Lord cares about us for whatever reason. Whenever I look on this guy, I know that, that God is here in the midst of us. That's how I picture Simeon. So now you you have this ordinary peasant couple stumbling around, asking around a temple, you know, how how do we pay this redemption? Who who do we talk to? Where are we going, right? So so you can tell that they're total newbies at this. They're young, starting out life, been married maybe a month, right? So they're they're newlyweds, kind of working on communication, all those sorts of things you you picture as kind of a, a comical scene. They pay a peasant's redemption. Nobody really pay attention to. Here's this guy who's been in the temple day and night. Regulars in the temple know this man. And all of a sudden he turns to this ordinary, insignificant couple, grabs her child, and and, and all of a sudden just has this joy about him where, where you look at him and say, what's going on? This is a couple that is insignificant. We could easily look past them and not even notice that they are there. I mean, maybe if they bump into us, we might notice that they're there. But there's really nothing significant or captivating about them. And yet this man who greets people coming into the temple, talking about the Messiah arriving, grabs this infant child. And there's no doubt in the presentation of how Luke reports us that his face is lit up. There's excitement. You can see it in his eyes. And all of a sudden, there's something about this child. And so we wonder, what what is going on here? What, What is so significant? Notice in verse 29. How you you have this blessing of Simeon. Lord, you're letting your servant depart in peace. So the the implication here is that as he's departing in, in peace and blessing God, right? We, we can see this reality of how he blesses God, lifts up his hands, and he's, he's taking joy in this, that this blessing of God is what the people are waiting for with Zechariah, right? There's no blessing. We mentioned the gospel ends with Christ raising his hand, giving a blessing. And so the celebration of the angels, 2 verse 14, blessing God for what he is doing. So this, this blessing of God is something that is tied to the messianic promise in Luke's gospel. That, that's what we've seen. Waiting upon Zechariah, stalled, end of gospel, Christ raising his hands, giving the messianic or Messiah's blessing, Christ's blessing, and the angels blessing God because Christ has entered history. So now when, when we have Simeon say, you're letting your servant depart in peace, 
Simeon's professing the reality of old age. If you visit with elderly people, they get to a point where they just say, I just want to meet my God. I, I don't get the point of living. I'm in pain. It's not fun. I sleep all the time. I hurt. I don't get why I'm living life right now, right? And it's not that they're trying to bring you down. It's just a profession of, I've lived my life. I want to see my Lord. I want to go and meet my Savior. I, I want to see him face to face. That's the tone of what's going on here. But as he's allowing him to depart in peace, this is a, a releasing from duty. So there's a sense of what Simeon has placed upon him where, where we don't really know how much the Lord has called him to be this level of prophet, but the implication is the Lord has called him to a prophetic role. And as he's called to a prophetic role, he has a burden. The Lord has said, you will see the Messiah. When you see the Messiah, you will be released from duty. So he's presented as, as a watchman waiting for the Messiah to arrive. That's the language in, in the original text. And as he's a watchman, he's not looking for, this is the important thing, he's not looking for a threat upon Israel. He's looking for the peace, right? The, the shalom. Now the shalom, as we've said, this is so important in Scripture. When we're at peace with God, it isn't that God merely tolerates us. It's not that God merely looks upon us and goes, ah, I guess I'll put up with you and I won't smite you today, but maybe tomorrow, right? That's how we can think of God. But having peace is, is that wholeness of being restored to God in this new covenantal relationship where we're brought near to him. You know, I said it before, but you think of that movement from the courtroom to the family room. That's the picture. That we're in fellowship with God. He knows all of our mess. He knows all of our sin. He knows all of, all of our misery. And yet he still loves us. And he still works in us and he still chips it away. That's what Simeon sang. And that's, that's rather shocking for a man who is righteous and devout. A man who has this, this relationship with God in such a way where he may very well have been called into the heavenly assembly like Isaiah and we see with the other prophets. We, we don't have record of that, but it's very likely. Paul the Apostle, we think of, you know, those, those sorts of callings that have happened with these extraordinary visions. He's probably had something like that as he knows the Messiah will come. And the reality is, even this man is professing here the unrest of this age, right? He, he's a, a, a prophet called to this extraordinary task on this ordinary day. And as he's called to this task, he's saying, Lord, I, I just want to go to your presence. This world has an unrest about it. There, there's a joy. We, we know you. We can know your shalom. But we have a greater angst, a greater desire to come into your presence. Notice what he professes then. My eyes have seen your salvation. So now this is language. And again, I, it was one of those things. Obviously, you don't have time to do this. But I encourage you, if you look at Luke 2, to look at Isaiah 40 through 66, and again, it's not, you know, take hours and hours and hours a day, but just read a chapter of Isaiah 40 through 66 and go through just this brief prophecy of what Simeon's saying and think about the implications of what Isaiah promises with what Israel would say, this is my deliverance from exile going back to the promised land to seeing how Isaiah takes us to the full new creation in the last part of his prophecy. And that's the thing that, that again, is so marvelous to me. Pious man, people know this man, and he looks upon this peasant infant child that would be easily overlooked, and he says, my eyes have seen your salvation. Think about that. He's looking upon a little infant who's a peasant, and he's saying, my eyes, I have witnessed firsthand your redemptive purpose. He's saying right here, Christ is the promise and fulfillment, the, the realization of everything God has said in covenant history right here, right before him. Insignificant child, but yet this man professes who this child is. We minimize the promises of God. It's not a problem with God. It's a problem with us. 
going on in terms of this prophecy as he's seen the promise of this, the, re- the reality of this. We think about the reality of how this is going on in verse fi- uh, 31 to all the peoples, right? So this language uh, is a language of nations. Uh, this would be like goim in, in Hebrew. If you ever talk to a Hebrew individual who's very uh, culturally sensitive to his identity of orthodoxy, he'll say the goims, the goims, right? So you have to watch the nations, watch the peoples. Well, the, the peoples, when, when you have this in the English, it simply means the nations, the, the variety of peoples that would normally be outcasts, those who are not worthy. Well, what's going on here is now he's saying you prepared the way for all the peoples. Now think about this language in Isaiah again. We think of the servant songs. We start with Isaiah 42, 6. First servant song. He's given as a covenant for, or to the people, a light to the nations, right? So the, the promise of the suffering servant is not just for Israel to bring them out of exile, but for all the nations. 49.6, the assurance that his salvation reaches the ends of the earth. Isaiah 52, uh, verse 13 through Isaiah 53, right? The last servant song, the climatic one. This is the assurance that the Lord is the one who's going to sprinkle many nations with his blood, right? So again, look at Isaiah 40 through 66. Think of Simeon's brief prophecy, and you see the intention there of how the suffering servant, the Christ child, that we can so minimize, right? Isaiah 52 uh, through 53 With the suffering servant, oh, he had no form or majesty that we would look upon him. Easily dismissed. Uh, Beaten to such a point where he's not even recognized. Easily dismissed. But yet the work that he does is magnificent and glorious. But we think also of Isaiah 61 and Isaiah 60 verse 3. Leading to the darkness of the land, to the ultimate light. Where the Lord casts his ministry as what? releasing those in bondage, bringing them out of slavery, giving them the eyes to see his glory as Simeon's making this profession. And so this is just packed rich with redemptive history and promises of God and what he's going to do. That is, he's a light to the nations, a light to the people. He's going to open their eyes to see his glory. And so as he goes on and he concludes this prophecy, and no doubt this is dramatic, and there's probably people at this point sort of scratching their heads and saying, what is going on in this corner over here? But now he turns to Joseph and Mary as they marvel at what he has said about them. But he turns to them. And as he turns to them, he tells them that there's going to be basically a piercing of a sword, not only for Mary, but for the peoples who follow him. But he wants Mary to understand that as this child goes and as it's appointed for him to rise and fall of many, there's going to be a sword. It's certainly prophesying his death. But the rising and falling is something else that's messianic. When we think of Psalm 118, we, we sang this psalm in our service already. But it's that assurance of how we have the Lord who is the one who is a stone that's cast away. I'm sure we're familiar with the psalm and how the Lord takes a stone that's cast away, thrown away, and uses it as his cornerstone to build his people together. And so what Simeon saying to Mary and Joseph is he's saying, listen, you may not understand the future fate of Christ. Now Joseph probably passed away before Christ was crucified, as we only read of Mary being at the cross. So he's most likely saying, listen, you you may not understand all the ins and outs of this Christ and all the controversy that's surrounding him, but the Lord's accomplishing something. He's building his eternal and true temple. In this age, through his people, as Psalm 118 certainly has that prophecy, you see that in Paul, you can see that in Peter, Paul especially in Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3, And you can see that in Peter, uh, where he certainly recalls that for us as well. But this language of how the Lord's building his people together from the nations, coming together from all classes, right? The peasants, righteous, devout, elite, however it may be. Theophilus, right? The great official. So you have 
you have the, the very wealthy, the high class to the low class, righteous, devout, all these variety of people coming together in this one temple. And so the Simeon's saying to Mary, listen, there's a purpose behind this. But there's something else when we think about the reality of how they're going to be seen, how they will truly have their hearts opened and perceived. Now, this is going to be shown throughout Luke's gospel. We talked about this with the shepherds, right? I mean, the, the shepherds, when they come in, we said the people marveled. And we said with that marveling, it could be either be a challenging of what Christ is doing, that you marvel that he is pushing social norms so far. How can this be a, a rabbi? Or you can have others that say, he's got to be a prophet. I, I need to know more of him. I'm going to follow him. I need to embrace him. He's life. So it can have either, either effect. But what happens is people are going to easily be discerned in this gospel, aren't they? And even today, either you follow Christ or you don't. You're going to have people chanting crucify, and you're going to have those uh, that are going to be defending him. You have an ax, the people that chant crucify are those who are cut to the hearts and later repent. And so they turn to Christ. So you see how their hearts are manifested in their fruits and their actions by their response to the Messiah. And so that's what Simeon's predicting. Going on then, you have Anna. We don't really know all the details about her, and I wasn't going to spend a whole lot of time building her life history because Luke doesn't tell us a lot about her. What we know is she's a prophetess. She comes from the eighth tribe of Israel, the tribe that was rejected. Could certainly be a, a communication of moving to the eighth day or the octave day. But notice that she too is longing for the Messiah. And she longs for the redemption of Jerusalem. Now we may hear that and say, oh, well, it means that we're literally going to go to Jerusalem. We're going to have these sorts of events fall in line. Or Jerusalem is simply the city of peace. It's the city where God dwells. It's a place that's the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. So what's the redemption of Jerusalem? Exactly what Simeon has said. Now, the thing I wanted to call to our attention in the midst of this is you have the prophet, who's a male, the female, coming together as an Israel that are professing and embracing this Christ. You have the peasants coming together, professing Christ. You have the elite official coming together, professing Christ, and the elite official with a Greek name. But the point of this is that with the mission of Christ... This very day, that's a New Year's Day for Israel. Now, not necessarily when Christ went to the temple. We don't know exactly what day this is. But in terms of the tradition of what this is calling to our attention to, the tradition of an exodus, the exodus event that reshapes Israel's calendar so that Israel recognizes that they are not identified as a people who are enslaved, but a people who are redeemed. That is their orientation as they start their year and where they are to see themselves as a redeemed people set free in Christ, living in the shalom of the true God, being built together as the Lord's people. And so what do these witnesses then testify about Christ? What is this really communicating to us about the gospel of Christ and its significance, redemption of Jerusalem and those sorts of things? It's a reality that the Lord works his extraordinary providence through ordinary means. That's one thing we, we certainly take from this. Going about the day-to-day -day mundane life, as you think, is rather insignificant. And yet, what's the Lord doing? Working in the midst of that. We find also even a prophet with the angst of this age wanting to go to heaven. Now, I'm not advocating that we see life as miserable or we hate life. But there is a reality of what this is communicating, that we do live under a common curse. And as we go about our days, there is a greater consciousness within us that we are a dying people in terms of our physicality, right? We're, we're a dying people. As you face each decade, you find more complications, more problems as you age. That's the reality of life. It's a common curse. 
But at the same time, what does Simeon tell us? So it's not just, well, we're dying people. It's pretty miserable. Why do we go to the new year then? It's not that. There's also the assurance that the Lord is working out his plan and using a dying people. That we are truly jars of clay, as the Apostle Paul says, with the glory of God placed within us. So we don't go out as a defeatist people. We don't go out as a people and say, well, I'm just dying, so who cares anyway? We go out as a people who have new life present within us, joined to the victorious Messiah, going forth in his blessing, in the shalom of the kingdom, that what oriented Israel as an exodus event, we are oriented as a people. And I love how the Apostle Paul continually exhorts us, and Peter does too, but Paul very consistently. You are a people redeemed in Christ, seated with Christ, therefore live unto Christ. That's what we're learning in Luke's Gospels. He's setting the bound, or, or the, basically the boundaries and the backdrop for this. You are a people redeemed in the shalom of the kingdom, of the nations coming together as a new temple people with a stone that has been cast away that the Lord has brought together to build his temple people as one people. And the Lord, by his providential care, by his glory, continues to work on us, conform us, and bring us into his presence more and more. Let us then be a people who certainly do long for the glorious reunion when we come to before our Lord definitively. But let us also be a people that as we live out our days under the sun, that we do not see these days as dreary days. These are days where the Lord has set before us and we get a privilege of living out his redemptive purpose. And we don't always think about this in terms of the ordinary. I know I don't, but maybe you do. I hope you do. You're more pious than I am then. But as we live out our days before the Lord, let us be conscious that it is a new year, new days set before us where we have a privilege of living out our redemption before the Lord, even in the ordinary tasks the Lord is doing his extraordinary work. Whatever he decides to do with it, how he decides to work it out. And ultimately, let us not lose sight to the reality. We are redeemed in Christ Jesus. Let us never minimize the significance of that blessing. We are redeemed in Christ as the nations, sprinkled in the blood of Christ, living in the resurrection power of Christ, let us live as living sacrifices unto our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, Reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity, please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, you can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage, urcbelgrade.com. You can also utilize our archive sermon series on our website, urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you. <music>